Well, hi there, racing fans, and welcome to another show with Winning Ways. And uh, it's going to be a great show today. I, I hope there's a tad sadness about today's show because, you know, Lev took that, um, that right hook, you know, when he won the big race in Johannesburg from uh, knockout King Phil Georgia. And um, unfortunately, uh, they've had to do a brain scan on him. But even more unfortunate than that is that um, very hard to find a brain. <laughs> um, anyway, they, they, they ended up they doing a whole lot of tests and apparently uh, they got uh, some of the top brain surgeons, Snickers and all these boys out there. Van der Merwe, I know him quite well from Royal, he says uh, Laf is a very peculiar case because he says that, um, you know, most people use about 5% uh, of their brain capacity up to 10%. He says Laf uses 100% of his brain capacity, but the brain's very hard to find. Anyway, um, so as a result, uh, welcome, Peter Gibson. We have you on the show today. Thank you, Paul. Uh, James, yeah, I should yeah, say, not yeah. Paul. He's no, no, he's, he's in uh, hibernation. I Paul. believe so. I mean, uh, can you believe it? A heavyweight knockout, uh, the heavyweight championships of Turfentine, Phil Georgia. I, we all thought that he was overcome with emotion when Harry Sun had won. Little when did we know. He just crumpled like a p paper bag. It seems to be the case. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, well, you know... We don't want to harp on about it, but um, I'm sure that he will, uh, you know, survive the ordeal and be back in a couple of weeks. He probably needs a week's recuperation. And don't worry, next week's co-presenter, a little prettier than Peter Gibson and certainly uh, quite a lot more erudite, uh, Jessica Slack, we're hoping to have on next week, which would be great. But anyway, let's go straight into our three to follow. Right, well, we're going to Kenilworth. Let's go and have a look uh, last Wednesday at Kenilworth. And we pick up, um, not Beach Beauty, Beach Goddess. Very nice run from this one, first time out. Let's go and pick her up at the start. There she is, drawn a bit wide. If they could run on, <coughs> we'd, we'd like to see the race, yeah. In, uh, in Longmore's colours, this is a filly uh, by Kildonan out of a Giants Causeway mess. It's got interesting breeding. Yeah, she's bred by Clava Flay, but this is one of the um, famous sons of the Vilgerborstruf um, stud. And she's in behind here in the blue cap. You can see her the Longmore colours. And um, I thought she ran quite a good race this filly. I think that she's, she's probably lost at this stage, uh, Beach Goddess. Yeah, look, uh, certainly showing that she's green, you know, looking to go through that gap. Um, but, and I know that the, the winner, the eventual winner, Lady Ming, is well fancied by the Robinson stable, um, a dynasty filly. And I think this filly of Ian's, you know, she, when she starts to run on, she, when she gets, to, gets the knack of things, looks a filly with a lot of promise. And she looks sizable from this picture here. Well, here she really starts picking it up. They've got less than 200 to go. The bird has flown. And um, she, she runs on really nicely. And I think that, you know, if she'd been a little closer going through the 400, she might easily have won this. Um, although the winner did win easily. As you say, Dynasty Kildonan, both from the Bulga Borstrup, you know. So, uh, <coughs> Correct. Bred by, right. bred by Mary. So um, fantastic to see that happen. But we're going to move on and go and have a look at the next one. Now, Walter Bass. Oh, Codger, he's too cunning for any words, but uh, nothing escapes us. We're going to go and have a look at the one on Saturday that he uh, stepped out, Vogue's Wood, beautifully bred by Peter Bly at the Clifton Stud. And um, I see Peter kept a share. That's got yeah. to be a first, you know. Peter's a bit tight, eh? Well, look, I mean, I, you know, he's, that mare has produced a lot of high-priced horses. The f this is the full sister to Fort Vogue, yeah. who eventually went to Dubai, and I don't think he actually survived the training regime there, right. unfortunately. But I mean, I'm, I'm glad Peter kept a share in this. Obviously, 
potential brood mess, the, the next generation to follow. Mm. And I hope she goes on. It certainly is a run full of promise. Yeah, I think he's, he made a mistake. Should have kept her share in the AP answer, which I bought the next year. But anyway, <laughs> let's go and have a look. I like the look of uh, Vogue's Wood. Let's go and pick her up. Now, these are in Peter's colours um, with his partners, Marsh Shirtliff and Bryn Russell. And Marsh, of course, um, did, uh, did race uh, uh, Fort Vogue with great success. He was a lovely, big, strapping colt. And this filly's got a classic pedigree, so you know, I mean, she's uh, with, with the right trainer for that sort of program. They've given her lots of time. And uh, you've got to think that uh, with the big features coming up, if she progresses in the way they, they would like to see her go, she's going to have a, a bright future. Yeah, um, she's sitting off them at this stage and uh, got quite a lot of ground to make up um, the winner. Quite well fancied here. I think that... Um, they think a bit of her, Star of Paris. Now, you remember last week, um, she, we picked her out as one to follow. She flew at the death. She was one of our three to follow and uh, just got beaten. So um, we think that uh, this filly will go on and, and uh, do some damage. But um, the Star of Paris is quite useful. She'll, she'll win some no, races. She's run her up twice in yeah. the two starts. So she's had plenty of race course experience. And obviously that counts for plenty in this game. But you've got to love the way that uh, Peter and Marsh and Bryn's horse ran on. Yeah, it's uh, definitely worth k keeping an eye on. You know, but, um, Mike Bass, uh, he brings them along really quietly. I think that they do a lot of, um, you know, building work and whatever with her. She, she ran, a, ran a pretty good race. And uh, I expect her to go on and do um, some, something in the future. The third one we're going to go and pick up is uh, Turfentine. And... Uh, Smaller stables every now and again chairs uh, step one out that looks like maybe they can run. But Matchy, Paul Matchett, he knows more about this game than most people. Champion trainer in Zimbabwe for a long time and uh, moved down here and done very, very well with uh, multiple Group 1 winners. So let's go and have a look at uh, Phuket. Mollet liked the name of this horse actually mm. in, the, in the interview. Yeah, he, he was very keen on this Spends horse. Spends a bit of time in Phuket, that yeah, uh, well, island resort of Thailand. Yeah, she stepped out slowly. She's on the left-hand side of your screen at the back. And um, the course seemed to be running pretty quickly. She only got into the race very late, Peter. Yeah, and uh, look, there was money for her. You know, open 25 to 1. I think they backed her into 8 to 1. She's by, by McGock. Scott Brothers bred her out of a spaceship mare. And uh, what I've noticed, certainly about the, the McGocks, they do tend, to, they show a good turn of foot. And this filly was somewhere out of her ground. Um, she's got the, the white sleeves and the pink on the inside. She's about four off the left-hand side. And she's about eighth or ninth at this stage. Um, the rest are gone. Uh, Paris Fashion is about five in front of her. And, um, she's um, the filly of Sean Terry's. I had a very yeah. good filly called Paris Fashion. I oh, did you, yeah. yeah. By Model Man. Mo Model Man's yeah, family. I remember her. Yeah, she was very, very good. But here she's running on up the inside with a nose band, the white sleeves, and motoring. Yeah, um, still fourth uh, with a bit of ground to make up. And here, she whew, literally she takes off. Absolutely takes off. Yeah. So, uh, very unlucky loser. And the filly that beat her had the experience. There are a couple with the experience. The third horse had the experience. Yeah. I think, think you could go in this frame. Look, the only thing that you time. might want to question about the form is that the first six past the post finished within two lengths. But uh, if you looked at her run in, as an individual, having her first start, I mean, you've got to say that was full of merit. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, she must have shown something at home and on that basis, we'll give her a, a chance. We think that uh, she might be well worth having a look at. We're going to move on and have a look at a blast from the past. Victory Moon Stakes, powered by Axe Coach Services. Gates are open and away and racing. 
Got them away to a good start. Tiger Play shows good early pace. American Storm on the outside is Sarissa Knock Onward. Cherry on the cake past all of them on the far side. The black and yellow colours. Menacing is in behind that with Master Sabina. Royal Bench is also passing them on the far side. Half the deficit there too. Further back in the field. Then we go back to the uh, Barracas towards the back end with Wild One racing towards the rear end of the field. And Bulse is there too. There must be about 14 lengths coming first to last year as they head away now towards the 1200 meter marker. 1,200 metres left to go. And the leader up front there is Sarissa. That's picked it up by half a length from Cherry on the Cake in second. Royal Bench has gone up into third. Knock on wood, fourth position at this stage. Half the deficit is in behind that. Then comes Tiger's Retreat up on the outside. American Storm. Tiger plays. Got about seven or eight to go with Ella Bella. Then comes towards the inside Master Sabina. Patriotic Rebel is racing further back in the field with Bulse further back behind those. Then comes Barraka, Wild One towards the back end. 600 metres left to go in the home straight. Royal Bencher moves up now to Sarissa. Half the deficit. Tigers retreat is towards the outside. Knock on with the orange and white. Then two lengths away. Master Sabina is running on quite strongly. And in behind that comes Ella Bella on the stand side. 3.50 to go. Royal Bencher. Knock on word on the outside tigers retreat master sabina is coming home strongly on the outside tigers retreat picks up the lead from master sabina on the stand side we set for a grandstand finish it's down the inside tigers retreat master sabina is catching master sabina tigers retreat very close maybe tigers retreat from master sabina illa bella and very tight for four well, uh, Sunna Tiger Ridge won that well, and this is always a prep for the Summer Cup, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, group 2 race, so there's plenty of good quality horses there, but saving, obviously, for the big day. Um, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a race that attracts that type of uh, top handicapper, and, um, you know, Master Sabina's obviously shown his, his worth. I think he won a big race on July Day last year. Yeah. Ella Bella, we, you know, that love that family for Mary, yeah. um, the Grey. But she wasn't quite as good as certainly her mother. But um, yeah, look, it was a it was a good race. I haven't seen Tiger's retreat subsequently, unless unless I've you know he he wasn't yeah. campaigned at the highest level since then. He's probably hanging around there. He'll be uh, back. Uh, maybe he's getting prepped for the Summer Cup. You never know. We'll have a look at the nominations when they come out in the final field. But um, certainly a good win for him, big son of Tiger Ridge. And um, we're going to move on there and have a look at the Plum of the Week. Uh, this is an interesting one. Moon goes in. 300 meters to go now. And the leader is Cherry Tripper. Cotswold runs on, but German Lady coming on powerfully now. Imperial Fabergé is also coming on well over the last hundred. German Lady, though, is going best of all. Cotswold running on for second, but German Lady's going to win it. Second place will go to Cherry Tripper, then Cotswold and Imperial Fabergé. Well, for the, those of you that listened to the Interbet podcast, that was uh, the best bet on the day and certainly backed in. Peter, from 7 to 2, she ended up 16 to 10, this filly. Yeah, look, she's a, I mean, another good winner for Rocco Gibraltar. Can you imagine if we were able to get Rocco Gibraltar in his twilight year as a stallion into South Africa? Well, they bought a few, which is very good for us. I mean, he's been outstanding. Yeah, he's yeah. just an unbelievable stallion. Yeah. But, uh, but certainly this filly won in a, you know, a typical... If you looked at her run before this, she ran in the race that um, that was rich girl. By, yeah, rich girl oh. won it, and she didn't look like she was quite tuned up. I think they're trying to get the race to hold up for rich girl that race, mm. and she looked like an mm. absolute blinder. And uh, you know, we do this uh, interbet podcast, yeah. uh, which you can listen to if you're an interbet client, and um, she was the best bet on the card. And to get five to two or seven to two about the best bet, 
And just looking back at her form, you know, she's run over 1,800 in the past. And yeah. to come back over 1,000, run on like she did, I mean, maybe that's her forte. I think they've worked out she's a mm, sprinter. Because sure. she's won a couple of sixes. She's never won a five furlong race. Yeah. Um, but she won that pretty convincingly. Correct. Yeah. And certainly from off them, she normally races right up there. But with Cherry Tripper in the race, you're guaranteed to have good pace. That's for certain. <laughs> you know, 800-meter anyway. race, Cherry Tripper would be a multiple winner. Yeah, she's very good. She is good. Very quick. Anyway, for those of you that are Interbet fans and Interbet um, uh, subscribers, you would have got the cash. And uh, we're going to have a look at uh, current affairs where we've got some very interesting news. You want to get the best odds on horse racing and sporting events. For every bet requested, we review all the bookmakers and select the one with the best odds. As a result, you always get the best odds. Interbet offers tote betting fixed odd multiples, and betting with your mobile phone. To get started, all you need to do is register by filling in your personal information. Log into your account and start wagering. Well, what a week it's been in racing, and uh, certainly we've got to start with Australia, where the first Tuesday of every November, they stopped the whole nation to watch the Melbourne Cup. And we certainly got up to watch it at six in the morning. Uh, it, was, uh, it shows you, go to the Somerville Clubhouse and see who's watching it. There's the real racing fans watching it. Alice the Gordon never yeah. misses, you know. <clears throat> Most of the guys don't even know no. that it's on. But um, the guys that love racing, they're there watching the, the, the race, and... Um, the Melbourne Cup this year was tinged with uh, sadness and um, we'll discuss exactly what happens afterwards. But let's go and have a look at it. On Monday, I tipped at my Rick T, the Japanese horse. Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack. But watch how quickly he falls out of it. There's obviously something wrong. And uh, what a ride from Ryan Moore on Perfectionist. Let's go and have a look at it from the start. The last one to go into the barriers. He lines up and the field is ready for dispatch. They're set. That's it. The cup field on its way. Geneva and Unchained My Heart with the first couple of bouts on the inside. Faulkner got away well. Mutual regard jumped quickly, so did who shot the barman. Areldo immediately over their heels, crossing towards the inside. Speed out wider was Mr. O'Kear and willing foe. Sign off going towards the middle of the pack in the early stages. Out very wide is Brambles and Au Revoir in the blue cap is the deepest runner. Precedence has gone back. He's last of all as they settle into stride. My Rekvi had got away well and he's up there with My Ambivalent. So they're the two leaders. My Ambivalent pulling hard on the inside. The leader from Admire Rekvi and two lengths away in third. Royal Diamond Fork has got over fourth today. Beautifully positioned. And then Janub Ladari. Lucia Valentino running foe for a little bit deep there from who shot the barman between horses. Then came Brambles on the outside of Unchained My Heart. Mutual regard. Au revoir wide around Red Cadeau. Protectionist and opinion. They're being followed further back by Sinoff. Uh, next on his side, inside was Aureldo as they sweep out of the straight. Gatewood towards the end. Uh, then Mr. O'Kieran who's caught out very wide. Precedence is back second last. And Sizemos is last of all as the Emirates Melbourne Cup field starts to stretch out because my ambivalent wants to run and she leads by about three lengths and my Rackby is holding down second about a length and a half to Royal Diamond third and they're a long way in front about four lengths clear then to Faulkner and over on the inside was Janoub as they run up the riverside with those as Brambles, a length and a half further back, Red Cadeau, who's deep out and he's on the move. Being followed then between horses is Willing Foe. Ladari's on the rail and Au Revoir is also posted out quite wide as they run up towards the 1400. Then came Sinoff, his midfield at the moment. Being followed further back then by Who Shot the Barman down on the inside of Gatewood, improving his place. And then Lucia Valentina, mutual regard and opinion. A length protectionist, Aureldo well back, followed by Unchain My Heart. Back to the end as precedence 
in company with Mr. O'Kieran and Saj Moss was still last of all at the 1200 metres. And the leader is uh, still my ambivalent by two at my recti. And Brambles had gone up into third placing, followed by Royal Diamond Red Cadeau. A length away is Genoove, and they're followed then by Uruguay. Faulkner by his time and sign off a starting a move. They're being followed by Ladari Willing Foe Gatewood. Well back in the field is opinion and who shot the barman, Lucia Valentina on the rail, followed by Mutual Brigade, Aureldo Protectionist, unchained by hard precedence towards the end with Mr. O'Kieran and Size Moss was still last. Coming around the turn now, and Brambles is the first one to race up and challenge my ambivalent as they swing around the bend. They're being followed by Red Cado, poised for his run, and so is sign off, and Au Revoir's wider followed by Gatewood at my rect is well back. Opinion is pulled out. Mutual regard is threading through. And so to protectionist Red Cado hits the front. Sign off coming after him with 300 metres to go. Willing foe starting to run on down the outside. And protectionist is bursting through. Protectionist race to Red Cado who shot the barman and then sign off. But protectionist raced away at the 100 metre mark. It's Germany's Melbourne Cup. Protectionist by three legs to Red Cado. And protectionist bolted in the cup by three. Red Cado second again. Bishop the Marvin third and then sign off. Willing foe, precedent to Rando. Followed by Au Revoir, Size Moss, Faulkner, Lucia Valentina. And next in Gatewood Opinion and quarterback in the field. Well, what a uh, couple of weeks for Ryan Moore. And, yeah. uh, you know, Molly thinks he's the best jockey in the world and he might easily be right. He might be right. You know, he's, as we were saying off, off air, he's not the prettiest jockey. But, I mean, he's got rhythm and balance and he's obviously got huge BMT. Um, he won the Cox Plate on Adelaide a couple of weeks prior. So, I mean, they, they recognise his skills. And this is another European-bred horse to, to take the Melbourne Cup, which is an irony in itself, given that Australia is so focused on two-year-old speed. <laughs> they just can't get their, the horses right. And Red Cadeau's run, Fantastic. phenomenal. I mean, eight yeah. years of age. Every yeah. time he gets on an aeroplane, he's bringing home a cheque for Ed Dunlop and his patrons. So... So it's a great race. Eh? He's just like Lafferty, actually just mentioning Lafferty quickly. You know, yes. those of you that are all phoning <laughs> to say, how's Laff and what's going on? He's actually just, uh, <clears throat> you know, to having a little sabbatical. Uh, but he, he's okay. He, listen, he needs it because he, he took, a, took a vicious punch. But uh, getting back to the race, yeah. the, the his sadness was mm. obviously losing at my but yeah. this happens, you know, that mm. thank God he didn't break his leg or something. Yeah, look, that was true. <coughs> it was surprising because I understand that he, he did die of a heart attack. Yeah. So it wasn't catastrophic. I thought Zach Purton, the Hong Kong-based jockey, rode a really kind race. He listened to what was happening. He didn't try and flog the death out of him. Yeah. Well, once and just let him drop back. And obviously, you know, he passed on once he'd got back to the stables. Yeah, but very and, sad. And then the, <coughs> the other sadness, which obviously... Um, Got all the bunny huggers in Australia yeah. jumping up and down. I don't know why there are any bunny huggers there anyway. They kill <laughs> kangaroos, they kill wombats, they kill any damn thing that they can get their hands on. And uh, a horse kicked the rail, yeah. got a fright from a child apparently, kicked the rail and fractured his leg yeah. and had to be put down, which was... But, I mean, it's a huge occasion. How many runnings of that race and all the other races? And these incidents occur. It's not yeah. nice, yeah. but, uh, you know, it can happen. Horses are highly strung. Well, I've seen a few horses kick the, 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 the rails here in the parade ring at Gravel. Oh, yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, we've got to do everything we can to ensure safe conditions for both horse and rider. Yeah. What is, um, uh, is fascinating was that I was reading what, uh, you know, what the people have to say, and there's a social media <laughs> so far. You can see everyone's got... And the people that are saying, oh, horses shouldn't be raced. Mm -hmm. They should stop horse racing. Sure. What... Most people don't understand, and we're preaching to the converted, is that this is a breed that has bred for hundreds of years yes. to race. For one purpose. That's all. To race. To race. Absolutely and correct. The breeding and everything goes year after year correct. after year to try and find the best racehorses, the fastest racehorses, and that's what the sport's all about. Of you course know? it is, yeah. You know, it's, um, it's a fa fascinating and fantastic sport and probably the most intricate um, uh, form of entertainment on the planet. Now, everything else is pretty sort of mundane yeah. with whatever there is, but horse racing is so intricate and so difficult to analyze. Yeah. If it wasn't, the no, sure. richest would be the best. But Of course uh, they would. And yeah. I think, James, if you take a broader view from the whole industry perspective, from the moment that foal is born on the, in a farm, 
right through to the point of running in an international race. And all those economic multipliers which feed into this incredible industry. You know, for me, racing has a serious place in any country that wants, that has an agricultural program. Mm. Because it binds agriculture with gaming in the middle, with sport, with entertainment, tourism, with exports, so foreign direct investment. It's a magnificent model if we can do it correctly. Yeah, well... And uh, so therefore, I going back to the point, is that those emotional outbursts about incidents which do occur in any sport, mm. you know, in the greater scheme of things, you know, it, it's just, it cannot be used as a means to stop an industry, yeah. is the point. Well, uh, it's fascinating how people think and how um, people get pretty damn upset about um, things that really are part of life, you know. Life yeah, and you have to admire so their love of animals. Yeah. I mean, you go through to the horse sickness environment, you know, we're going through our next season coming up. The emotion that comes with the horse sickness season and people losing their horses as a result of this infection. Just on that, <coughs> on that point, um, we watched Harry Sunderland last week for Laugh and that, and he w wasn't able to go mm. to Cape Town because there was supposedly an outbreak of horse sickness w in KwaZulu Natal somewhere. Well, look, what was that all about? I understood that, that he was in breach, and I might stand corrected, um, he was in breach of the entry conditions to the Western Cape because of vaccination. Mm. So that he wasn't, I, d I didn't understand that there was a, a suspected case of horse sickness. Mm. At Summerfield. If there was, it certainly was negative, mm. and the normal movement controls will apply. Mm. And there was a suspected in the Western Cape, which subsequently proved to be negative as well. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the movement con conditions require that your horse is vaccinated at least 60 days before entry to the Western Cape. Well, it's so they might have been vaccinated closer than 60 days. Can't be before. within that period. Yeah, can't yes, be within period. that period. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 found it fascinating and when you look at uh, this race this uh, Melbourne Cup and see horses from everywhere the winner is trained incidentally by Andreas Waller who's from Germany yeah. he's a German champion trainer and I think he trains for the Jakobs family in, he might uh, do and the horse Monson I oh. think definitely stood yeah. with them and uh, he's been an absolutely yeah. amazing Superstar. Yeah. Yeah. and he's I think the uh, the I think Dali bought into him in a big way at some point yeah, he's, a, he's produced um, um, an Arc de Triomphe winner. Yeah. He's produced whatever you want to win, Monson's produced. And it goes back again to, James, the quality of German breeding. Yeah. Certainly that staying, staying type of horse, endurance, um, very, very strong controls about uh, no bleeding and use of medication, etc. Yeah. They really are a shining light in the, in the breeding industry. Well, around the you, world. If you look, uh, Chris Waller ran third. Uh, that was under the Australian that uh, sort of fell into third place. Uh, they, they're under a bit of pressure, these um, Aussies, as far as the Melbourne Cup's concerned. I said to Laf three years ago, they'll never win the Melbourne Cup again. I think Gay won it, but she won it with an They better be careful not know. to let the cock in as well. And they're <laughs> well, in even they're more trying, trouble. <laughs> listen, they're trying their damnedest <laughs> not to true. let the cock anywhere. That's the <laughs> point. The only place that you can get to is Dubai. It takes him six months, mm. and my goodness gracious, that's yeah. a disaster. Right, we're going to go to Kenilworth, and we're going to go and have a look at uh, Saturday, the 8th of November. We had uh, the first of the big fillies uh, features coming up, the Choice Carriers Championship, and it's really a good pointer to paddock stakes, fillies, guineas, all those type of races that are coming up. Let's go and see what happened here. Very interesting race. Up to go and double whammy has come to the front to lead the way a length and a half or so clear. Cold as ice is in second. Harvard Crimson is in third. Jet set go. The black body, the gold cup is on the rail. Three lengths off the leader. At a girth, we find Inara. Then comes Lucky Tuesday, being followed by Seven Grand, Thaler Point, and Grey Light is going to whip them in as they flatten for the run to the judge. Choice Carriers Championship, 450 metres left to go. Double whammies trying to make each and every caller winning one. Cold as ice under a tight hole looms up on the outside of her. Jet Set Go is coming through on the inside of her. Then we find Lucky Tuesday. Thaler Point is sitting next. They're into the final 200. Double whammies now being pressed by Cold as Ice, who breezed on by. And Cold as Ice has kicked for home, and she's got the Choice Carriers Championship in the bag. Cold as Ice easing up from Double Whammy. Jet said go in, and then came Lucky Tuesday. 
Well, Triumph for Joey Ramson, he's on a roll at the moment. He won the big race in PE the other day, and yeah. uh, he's uh, starting to write articles with gusto again. I read in the sporting <laughs> he posts, he's, he's got a lot follow, to say. Follow now, his Joey. mood and his articles. Yeah, jo Joey, <laughs> Joey's now back, back, back in the flag. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw his mate Kim Parks. He says that uh, when Joey's having a, having a run, doesn't even phone him, you know. He's the best <laughs> mate in Durham. I think he's his only mate, and uh, <laughs> he doesn't even phone him. So Kim's very upset with you, Joey. But uh, anyway, good luck to you. Um, uh, the stable is firing. Fad Herb rode this one, and this uh, daughter, Western Winter, really looks like uh, she could be one of the best buyers around. She costs a lot of money, but she she's did cost. But she's out of a fantastic family. A lot yeah. of speed there. I mean, I was just talking now that you know the first three past the post. There's quite a lot of speed. There's no doesn't obvious stand out that they're looking for the mile. And if you look at yesterday's conditions, tailwind that was running pretty quick, you know, nothing really came, I mean, obviously, uh, cold as ice, got past double whammy mm -hmm. and then stayed on nicely. I, I think but they're very good fillies. I yeah, mean, I think double whammy set her own fractions in front that didn't go very yeah. fast. I've always loved Grey Light. I think yeah. that she's, a, she's the best filly over a bit more ground. Is she yeah. not looking for that artificial surface? I mean, she did absolutely... I, I think that impressive her, on this poly track. I think her runs um, uh, in the mm. two group ones that she ran from way back uh, yeah. over the miles in Durban in the season, and she'd probably be better yeah. now. She'd Looking be, for she'd be my long term choice sure. for something like the paddock stakes. She might end up mm. winning the paddock stakes, but uh, we never always right, and we take everything with a pinch of salt and have a go. But just going on to the breeding because we're going to be mm. talking about breeding in the cells. Uh, just a couple of interesting things that uh, happened in America, at, uh, yeah. the big cell there. <coughs> Barry Irwin's been um, very involved there, and he bought Crimson Palace mm. back to put to Animal Kingdom, and he's apparently buying mares to put to Animal Kingdom. He bought a warfront mare, um, and uh, so did Claverflay mm -hmm. buy a warfront mare to come to their Vahors, mm -hmm. you know, so it shows you that... What did they eventually pay for Crimson Palace? I think she he paid about uh, seventy five. Did he? Yeah, yeah. seventy five thousand. Sure. So that was the that was the filly that won that big race in America. She was bred by Altus Jabez yeah. Retail Scroll Stud, if I yeah. remember correctly. It was a Beverly D. I think she was in she fact won. bought by Godolphin. Yeah, that's to right. Race for they, them. they they sold her. So now they've they've got released her. Yeah. So well. Well, she's had she's been a bit disappointing. She's mm. but she's apparently in fault in Costa del Lago. Okay. And my friends in America told me that she's um, going to Animal Kingdom. Mm. That's why Barry bought her. Mm. And I said I thought that they should buy into her because, you know, he puts together yeah. the syndicates, but apparently he's put together quite a big syndicate. Hell, he's done well, Barry Owen. He's been, yeah, uh, no. you know, he's Phenomenal been very good success South Africa breeding. Oh, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we, and <laughs> going back to Exwood, how, wouldn't it be nice if we were able to find a quick solution for these guys who are investing in South Africa? Mm. Talking of Grey Light again, her sire Tappet is mm. now the top price stallion in terms of service fees. I think in they the raised world. him to 300000 US dollars for a cover. Yeah. 300,000 US. No guarantees. Yeah. Yeah. He, he is the highest price horse in the world. But I, I saw as well that his yearling average return was 600,000 US. Yeah. So obviously there's justification in doubling his fee. Okay, I want to throw a curveball at you. Who would you rather go to? Would you rather go to him or Frankel? Frankel's Interesting question. You know, guineas. from a South African perspective, I'd go for Frankel. Mm. Turf, guaranteed turf. He's by Galileo, son of Galileo. From a fantastic European line. For me, I would go Frankel. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter, for that. Uh, <laughs> Not that it counts for much. <laughs> very, very important information. We're going to go and have a look at your call where we're going to discuss breeding in a little deeper fashion. So enjoy.
Chris Nate, congratulations on having purchased what is currently the sale top at 1.1 million. A uh, progeny of Star Witness, out of that Group 1 winning Battle Maiden. He was a beautiful horse. He was beautifully turned out by Balmoral. He walked like a, a leopard, and I had to have him. Well, uh, but they've done a fantastic job uh, at their facility. Nicola's obviously got a training license, and she's got a volume of experience. And, of course, Mark is very, very involved in the polo side of things. So it's a, it seems like it's an exceptionally good combination, the two of them together. Definitely. Uh, they're by far the best doing um, uh, this, the breaking and the, the ready-to-run. And they've, got a, they've, got, they've taken them years, and they've got to the top, and well done to them. Obviously, the, uh, the guesswork is limited over here in respect of having seen the horse move. Does that impact heavily on your decision to part with 1.1 million rand? Well, you know, I don't look much at the gallops. I, will, I look at the horse, the individual, and how he moves. I wasn't there at the gallops. I saw a, a clip of him gallop. It, it didn't impress me. The horse impressed me. That's why I bought it. And um, I think he's a superb athlete. Well, yesterday, of course, Charles Laird, with the daughter of Rock of Gibraltar, picked up a very healthy 1.7 million rand for victory, and that's a, it's a huge incentive, but I'm sure not the only reason that you buy these horses. Definitely, and, you know, we, we've been missing out on a few of these races, but now we can get up to Joburg. We've got our own yard opening up in May, and we'll be able to race, train our own horses in Johannesburg, and that's a huge plus for us. Well, you know, on the lighter note, you guys are used to the wild west of Philippi, so living in Johannesburg won't be all that bad. <laughs> it won't be a problem, I promise you. A beautiful old expression says that as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And of course that's been a very, very fortunate part of your racing involvement, but it hasn't come easy. You've had your Group 1 winners, but uh, I'm sure you're looking to get some more with the rich vein of form that you're currently enjoying. That, that's true, but uh, as I say, we've got a team effort. Uh, I work a lot with Charles Laird, a lot with Anton Marcus, and we negotiate what's good and what's bad and we make our decision from there. Well, it's a formidable combination. If it's good enough for Marcus Hurst, it must be good enough for you. And I see that you're also having a lot of fun in the game. Yeah, I'm starting to love the game a lot now. That's why I'm investing in this game, because I feel it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good game. If you do the right uh, decisions, you start to enjoy it. You had a beautiful filly that must have given you an enormous amount of pleasure called Dylan's Promise, who is so well-bred. Uh, is, there, is there substance to the fact that you sold her overseas? No, I'm quite happy I sold it overseas, and we, she did us proud. We won the group uh, two, the Oaks twice, and it's the only filly, I think, in the world to win the Oaks twice. It is certainly very, very exciting. Lovestruck, I see, was uh, victorious the other day in Mauritius, so clearly he's still got a lot of racing left in him. Yes, definitely. He's coming back to his best now. I think that break needed, he needed a break, and we'll see more of him soon. Well, you've gone to 1.2 million rand for... Uh, a Bernardini over here out of coffee shop, a beautiful mover. A lot of the guesswork's taken out by the work, but what really made you fall in love with this fella? Well, when I saw the book, when I opened the book I said, and I watched the gallops, I said, this is my best one for the day. And I spoke to Charles Laird, spoke to Anton, did the homework, got the vet involved, 
he did all his homework and he said go for it in there. Well, when you think of the payday that Charles Laird had yesterday, 1.7 million rand for that, for that beautiful Philly rich girl. She's now made Marcus a rich man, not that he needs it, but uh, hopefully it can be your turn next year. Well, please God, hope that happens. <laughs> Michael in this beautiful museum steeped in history. Hopefully you're finding a horse here that's going to take you back into the pages of history as you've done on so many occasions. Tell us about your acquisitions. Um, the Var cult is a darn nice cult, you know. Um, he was bred by Aventir. Obviously he was bought off the Cape Premier sale, so that qualifies him for the million dollar race, which also attracted us to award him. But he was a, a, a nice specimen. We liked him in Cape Town as well. Uh, we should have bought him there. We would have got him cheaper. He went for 450 in Cape Town. But obviously he's matured and he's done a lot better with time, so we took our chances on him, we bought him, and I think he could be an interesting horse for us. Lot number 50, the Western Winter Philly. Also a very, very smart individual, um, a nice, strong, burly filly. I've only trained two ever Western Winter Phillies. One was on her toes who won me a Group 1. Won the Guineas as well, which was a Group 2 and ran second in another group one. So she was a good filly to me. And as well as Mike Cassie, who ran second in two group ones for me. And on both occasions, the jockey that rode her got off her in the second box and said, I'm so sorry, you should have won. I tossed it. Perhaps you'd be interested in taking these horses back and, and nurturing them, not necessarily going for those races, although a million dollars is not to be sniffed at. No, absolutely, Andrew. If the horse is right, then you've got to go for it. But I don't believe in pushing horses. When you push these horses, you don't have a horse later on. And... That's my one thing about these races. These races are not good for the horse. They're good for everyone else to get interested into the game and, and the owners to want to buy horses and things like that and attract people into the industry. It's all about marketing and bringing in all the different players into the industry and with bringing different players into the industry, also helping people that are in need. And I think it all goes well for the future if people can carry on marketing the racing in this way. We've got to get down and work really hard. There's no place for complacency in the industry. We need to get rid of it. And the people that are the major players in the industry need to get off their backsides and push and push hard because we've got to keep this industry alive and kicking. Kevin, positive energy is very hard to suppress and I've spoken to a lot of people about this side and it has been an enormous positive vibe but we'd like to know exactly what the vital statistics of the 2014 Ready to Run sale have been. Yes, Andrew, it was very positive. Our aggregate was just under 22.5 million. Our median was 155,000 and our average was... 243,000, which we're very, very happy with. Testing times, but I think that the euphoria of yesterday's race must have certainly lifted the spirits of people who came to the sale today. Yes, I think so. And I think you, you, you'll have seen there were a large spread of buyers, and there was a horse for each buyer. Obviously not a lot of international participation, but there was one at least in the lot one where uh, Hong Kong, who've been loyal supporters, of Bloodstock South Africa got involved. Yes, it uh, went for 340,000 and uh, yeah, we're very happy. We will get international buyers, it's just very difficult because they want to watch their horses on their home turf and with our export protocols it's just very difficult uh, for them. They don't like leaving their horses here. For example, Rich Girl is a daughter of Rock of Gibraltar and she's going to proliferate her genes in South Africa at Clava Flay Stud with their magnificent stallion band. But the point is that People are pin-hooking horses across the globe, and some of them are reaching astronomical prices, of possibly one or two a little disappointing by the uh, standards that they set themselves. But overall, do you get a good feeling about the, the vendors and their, their expectations of those international horses? Yes, I think so. I think we were a bit disappointed in the two Australian horses, the Henry the Navigator and I'm Invincible. Um, we feel that they, they should have fetched higher than the, the prices that were bid. But, you know, sometimes buyers just don't like the horse. And, uh, yeah, but I think the others did, did go for good prices. That's basically the end of the year for Bloodstock South Africa. Looking forward 
uh, very exciting things uh, happening in Cape Town. Yes, uh, very, very exciting. We've got our Val de Vee sale in February, and we've got uh, a gala dinner on the first night of the sale, a select sale. And the difference in, uh, about this select sale is that the breeder can buy in a 10,000 rand, and they select their own horses. So they think their horse is good enough, they buy in, and we're going to limit it to 50 horses. And uh, black tie dinner, so I think, oh, it's very, very innovative. And of course, it's a time of the year that everybody's so excited about racing. There's a lot of, lot of energy from the international perspective as well. Yes, yeah, that's all the, you know, people internationally go to Cape Town over that period. So we'll hopefully we'll attract a few international buyers there as well. And they tell me a venue second to none. Yeah, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Very hot, but we we looking after that as well. We're going to have sprayers spraying all over, so that uh, the horses and the people are looked after. Well, there we go, and uh, what a nice insert from Andrew Bon, and uh, what a sale it turned out to be, Peter. You certainly copped it. I would have thought you guys have got to be pretty happy. Yeah, look, obviously, considering the circumstances, a much smaller draft, um, I think the quality of the catalogue was outstanding. There was a lot of depth to it, a lot of spread of stallions, and, um, you know, I was pleasantly surprised. Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but just how much support there is out there in the buying camp. You know, buyers like yourself, you don't have to be loyal. You go with the best horses at the best price. That's all you should really worry about. At the end of the day, um, we've got to be loyal to Magic Million. So let's just have a quick look at what, okay. they, what they had over the week. And they had some wonderful winners. Mahal Princess, Royal Security Pa, unannounced. He's back to his best. Royal Security Baby. And then obviously the, the uh, Harry Sun who won the big race at uh, Turpentine. So, you know, that's a Magic Million sales company. We go wherever we can try and find ourselves mm -hmm. a horse. But... There are, it's an interesting thing with the split and uh, yeah. the aggravation that I've, I've noticed that um, people are, there are a lot of people that are very, very loyal to the Thoroughbred Breeders Association yeah. and the breeders, I think, will end up being loyal to the Thoroughbred Breeders. I don't think it's a bad thing that we've got opposition. No, not at but, all. But um, you just saw that there was a lot of money at the sale. There was, and uh, you know, a lot of people found it difficult to buy horses, which gave an indication of the quality. I don't think there were standouts. There were obviously were three horses over a million, but there was no real horse that you know justified paying you know big big money. But um, across the board, I mean, we had very good feedback from the sale, and I think there's a lot of scope now. There's space in this sale for it to grow. Uh, we think that we'll probably get back to 180 horses in the next year. Um, there's talk about the cup race itself, whether it should be split. I think Mike de Cox made a few comments, which I think is entirely valid. Obviously, the more horses, the bigger the prize money. Therefore, you know, this, this sale will, will basically be capped at 2 million rand next year. Still, it's a good prize. Further down the line, so I think there's scope to maybe look at two races, oh, different oh, uh, distances. There, there is a point that I, as a buyer, find a little irksome, yeah. and um, I would like you to explain it to me. Basically, this sale is self-funding. You know, Correct. When you, when you look at it, I know there's a lot of chat about mm -hmm. how big the stakes are and whatever, this and that and the other, but it is self-funding. We pay 10,000 rand um, at Buy -in. purchase, yep. so you have 120 horses of 1.2 million rand. I don't know what happens to the operator's nomination fees and all of that. Does that go as part of the stake? The vendors do contribute uh, a similar amount at yeah. the time of entry. So it's an expensive sale for the vendor to, per to participate in. So the vendors are putting in 1.2 million rand. We're putting in 1.2 million rand. That's 2.4. Okay. No, I think that, the, look, I'll have to get the sum. We could g circulate exactly what the sort of uh, prize money spread will be. Okay. But um, I think you need to look at the lot. No, horses sold. Not yeah. every horse is obviously going to be entered for the sale. A lot of people don't actually tick the box. Mm. So the, the but net do a lot of people position, not tick the box? Quite a few do. Yeah. Quite a few do. And I think that if you look at the sale, there are two parts to it. One is that you're buying a horse because he's, he's gonna, you hope to have a good race horse on your hands. Not every horse on the sale looks like he's going to be suited for that date next October, November. In other words, some horses are just going to take a lot more time, others are going to not necessarily get that trip. So there are going to be some horses which will not be entered for the sale. Mm. So therefore, that your total um, entries will actually be slightly less than the number of horses catalogued. 
Is there but any way? It is self-funding. Is there any way that, uh, that buyers can see exactly how the split works, yes. or, or vendors can see exactly how the split works? How many horses have had the boxes ticked? You know, yeah. I think I think those are the type of of sort of grey areas yes. that would really improve the um, uh, perception as far as the sale is concerned. Now, I agree with you entirely. You know, Kevin uh, Woolward is putting in lots of different systems. We've updated our sort of accounting system after a long time of, of having what we've had in the past. So there's going to be a huge amount of ability to generate these sort of statistics. And we're closing the sale much earlier than it has been in the past. So a lot of things have been tightened up. And I'd like to go back and show exactly what number of horses have been entered at a certain point. And of course, I believe that the vendor who contributes a, a, a significant amount should also be rewarded in the cup race. Well, I think that's, that's, that, that, should be, that is a fair contribution to, to consider. That's the next point. What interests me is that the ascendancy of Balmoral as a, um, a pre-training farm and how well they've done it. It shows you what an opening there was for them. They've, they've done really well. Well, like in, in around the world, you know, there are specialized consigners that are taking horses to prepare them specifically for a sale, whether it's a yearling sale or a ready-to-run sale or a breezer. And I think Balmoral have done an outstanding job. I think there's space for others. Mm. And I think that there are other vendors or breeders who might want to actually now tack on to this sale. Part of their business model, holding on to horses for a little bit longer, certainly those ones that didn't sell early. So, um, but certainly Balmoral and others have done a great job in preparing their horses. I don't think personally that the emphasis should be on speed. Mm. You know, you want a, a horse that's in good shape when it's transferred to your training stables. Mm. And um, that what needs about to the, be considered. What about the aspect of timing then? Oh, look, for me, I don't believe that's, uh, I don't think we should go that route, in my own view. I know it's done in America and increasingly in Europe. But I think that then places emphasis on more work, greater risk to the animals themselves. And um, whilst it might appear to attract a sales component, I just think that it adds problems. Mm. You would have to do it on a racetrack. Currently, we, we're you know, putting but all the why gallops. Would you, Peter, why would you have to do it on a racetrack? Surely you just set up a time system between here, a furlong, they run for a furlong, okay? No, no, fair enough. In that fair furlong, enough. doesn't matter. It's the same for everyone. Yes, you know, they're no. all they no, all that's true. Um, if but you I have a thunderstorm in the middle of it, then yeah. that's a different no, story. No, sure. You know? <laughs> I think you know you want a surface which is as safe as you can. Yeah. I think the future of the sale, as I see it, and it's going to be considered in time. It obviously depends on availability of racetracks. Is that the breeze up is done very close to the sales date, so that you're bringing people together for the whole event. Mm. Breeze, day of viewing and then sell, mm. especially for the overseas clients. Cl Lars Kelp, in fact, mm. made that comment when I saw him yesterday or over the weekend. Int interesting chap. I hadn't met him. I met him yeah. on the bus on the way to, to the sale. Um, and he's got an interesting uh, model and uh, look at South African racing. He says it's ridiculously cheap, and he says it's very good, and he thinks the horses are very good. Absolutely. You know, Lars, I think he had a runner in that in the, the cup race, Kosova, mm. running on strongly from a terrible draw. In fact, as he was due to race yesterday, but they got washed out. But Lars is, again, another one who's looking at this as with a longer-term view. Mm. I think he's got a very good eye. He's had some great success. Um, he's got horses with Mike de Kock and Dean Canemar. Mm. And uh, we welcome his investment. Well, if, uh, many more if we could get them, would be fantastic. Let's talk about the upcoming year. It's obviously yes. been, it's been a year filled with trauma for uh, Bloodstock South Africa, who are you know, part of us. And um, well, let's uh, just see what's going on as far as the year is concerned. I think we've got a couple of slides. Yeah, two with, slides, um, just to break them up. Let's have a look at the, at the dates. So the, the new sale that you heard Kevin Woolward talking about uh, is the Val de V yearling sale. This has really been uh, established uh, at the request of many of our members um, mm -hmm. in the Cape to be able to sell again. You know the Bloodstock South Africa TBA sold for many, many years at Goodwood and other places in the Cape. Many very good horses came out of it. Pocket Power being one of them. There'll be two parts to the sale, a select session. Mm -hmm. The dates might change subject to discussion with Val de V estate. But it's around about the 21st, 22nd, 23rd. We'll, we'll confirm that this week. Um, and there's a select session. Breeders are able to select their own horses at a certain fee. And then the balance of the sale will be held the following day. And we're hoping to get around about between 150 and 180 horses. 
altogether. Altogether. So, so how many would you sell on a select session? 50 only. 50 only. 50 only. It'll and be it would be like the green pages of old, would it be? With, with a very important difference. They're not pre-selected. This mm. is a this is a, these are breeders who are nominating, making their own judgment themselves, nominating horses for that sale session. they pay a bigger commission? They pay a bigger, they, no, not the commission, but they'll pay an entry fee of 10,000 Rand up front. Okay. It'll be held in a gala dinner setting. Mm. So really trying to create a nice social occasion surrounding that. And of course, this sale been reintroduced to the Cape, it'll have to be run over a three-year period in order for us to properly gauge its success. Yeah. But we're very excited about that. Valdivia is a magnificent estate. And just on that, uh, Susan Roth, the chairman of the TBA, is going to have a feedback session to the breeders at Valdivia on Thursday this coming week okay. from 11. We've sent out a circular, but just in case those breeders Anyone didn't see Anyone that it. wants to go there? Um, yes. Um, will yeah. you video conference it so that people can watch it elsewhere? No, look, we won't, but we'll obviously, rec you know, provide feedback at the end of that. Okay. So Susan and I will be there for that uh, day. Uh, uh, okay, then looking at the, at the next sale, there's obviously your big sale in, it's at the, Easter. The premier yearling sale of the country. It's the, it's the best horses on, on offer. Um, yeah. It's the right time of year. It's a magnificent sales complex. We're always getting compliments about the TBA sales complex in German, purpose built. So yes, that's a, it's the same sort of timing. It's a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah. Really, we changed that, I think, um, because of the clash with the Hong Kong April meeting. Yeah. And so to allow buyers to come in like Tony Millard, David Ferraris, and others. And, uh, but anyway, that's the premier sale. And then we move on to the Cape um, Mare and Weanling sale. Yeah. And there's a possibility of uh, putting on a yearling sale, again, just for local guys that want to sell their horses or local breeders who want to sell their horses at the 22nd of May. We'll confirm the venues. Yeah. The Cape Merin Weanling is at Klein Plassey in Worcester. Yeah. And then the next slide will show us the balance of the sales in the season. The increasingly popular KZN sale. Yeah, it's a good sale. It's a good sale. And right a lot here of at Suncoast. Absolutely. Yeah. Right before the July, mm. it's got that sales race attached to it now. Mm. It's become very popular. I wouldn't call it the Gold Coast sale of South Africa, but, you know, it's got a nice feel about it. Then the KZN Mare and Weaning sale, it's a small sale on the Monday after the July. That's a change from previous year where we had it on the Wednesday. The national two-year-old sale, very important sale. Yeah. It's an opportunity for breeders to sell their late developing horses or horses that weren't sold in earlier sales. It's an opportunity for ready-to-run vendors to pinhook and put into the system. And then, of course, we're talking about our final sale of the year would be the ready-to-run. We keep that 30th, which is the Friday night, and the first, our traditional sales date, uh, subject to numbers. Yeah, but so that really is our sales program for 2015. And we thank all of our, of our buyers and of course our breeders who are loyal to the, the TBA. And we look forward to a fantastic sales season next year. Well, Peter, we look forward to uh, the continued support from yes. everyone out there. And um, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, in crying circumstances. Um, you yes, know, to, it's sad uh, to hear about Laf, but yeah. I'm glad that he's, he's okay. He's actually fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he's going to get well, Giorgio back, though. I that think we're that's making tea when we made the last announcement. <laughs> he's fine. He'll be back. He'll be back in a couple of weeks. But uh, next week, we're going to have uh, Jessica Slack, hopefully, on the show with us. And uh, she'll talk to us a bit about uh, the breeding operation that they're involved in, uh, Maritzfontein and Wilgerbos Drift. But uh, from me, James Goodman... Peter Gibson, thank, thank you for you, joining James. us. To all you racing fans out there, have a wonderful week's racing.